Not own person who always has several gadgets at hand that provide access to any information in the world and non-stop communication with people, it is difficult to assess how valuable this is. To give a signal, our ancestors had to burn bonfires, beat drums or send a messenger. How was the exchange of information carried out in Russia, including urgent, before the development of technology, and why did martial law contribute to the development of the postal system? During the Tatar mongol invasion, when the Russian principalities lived separately, there was an urgent need to keep in touch with each other. It was at this time that the development of the so-called Yemskaya service began, which can be called the progenitor of the modern postal system. The irony of fate lies in the fact that the stations where the messenger could change the horse and go on were arranged by the Tatar Mongols, they also began to call them pits, securing such a name for them. Translated, Yamchi means guide. In the Golden Horde itself, such a service was already sufficiently developed. There were a certain number of horses, and the messengers had special certificates. Thanks to the last driver, they had to help let them spend the night or feed them. Special bells were installed on the messenger's horses, which warned of his approach. After all, if a messenger is in a hurry with very urgent news, then he did not have time or opportunity to stop for a rest, and he had to prepare another horse as soon as the bell rang. Since the same time, the well-established expression the matter is in the hat has come into use. The coachman often sewed up what needed to be moved to the most secure place under the lining of the hat. So, they started talking about the almost solved case, they say, the case is in the hat. In parallel with the Yemskaya service, there was such a duty as transportation. The population was charged with the duty to transport military ammunition, armored vehicles, although it could be anything. The Yemskaya chase was also at first a duty that was assigned to people living in large settlements. Later, people who did this regularly began to be chosen as drivers. They were called the Yemsky hunter, a person who does this on his own hunting. Special requirements were imposed on the driver, besides the position was elective. It had to be a decent person who had at least three horses, as well as a sleigh, a cart necessary for the transportation of goods. On the social ladder, the coachmen stood above the peasants, but below the servants. They were relieved of many responsibilities. In general, being a driver was quite prestigious. In the 16th century, the Yemskaya service was already quite common. His work was supervised personally by the sovereign, who was responsible for all roads. After that, a separate Yemskoy order appeared. In the 17th century, a new round of development began news began to arrive from abroad. This was done by a Dutch entrepreneur who was paid in rubles and sable skins. Basically, his duties consisted in delivering newspapers from Europe, on the basis of which a brief overview was compiled for the Tsar and the Duma from the Boyars. Peter the Great, of course, brought his own changes to this area. The number of postal routes has increased, and post offices have appeared in large cities. By the beginning of the 19th century, there were almost 500 post offices, and almost 5,000 people were involved in the work of the post office, and their number was constantly increasing, because the number of routes served was growing every day. The postal service turned out to be a very profitable business. Private individuals exchanged letters more often, and government documentation was sent less often. The postal service of that time was often called German. This is due to the fact that the Russian newspaper was a kind of digest of foreign news, and the very word correspondent meant a person who processes foreign news and sends it to the newspaper. In addition, letters from private individuals were delivered all the way from the German settlement itself. The sovereign also used such a connection with abroad. On average, a driver could get to the border from Sweden in 11 days. The social status of postmen has also changed somewhat. Their working day lasted up to 16 hours. All this time they spent with a heavy bag, walking 2,030 kilometers a day. Even then, they wore a special uniform that made them recognizable. Most often, men and women worked as postmen, if they were engaged in the work of postal services, than in the office. Moreover, an agreement was concluded with them to terminate the contract in case the employee marries. Stamps appeared as a fight against queues. After all, in order for the letter to be registered, people had to stand in huge queues. After the appearance of stamps, this need disappeared. The letter could simply be thrown into the mailbox, as it is happening now. Even then they were painted blue, 
which has become traditional for the Russian Post. By the February Revolution, there were about 20,000 mailboxes throughout the country. In the 30s, an innovation was introduced. In order to reach a larger number of the population, mailboxes began to be made mobile and attached to trams. Despite the fact that the idea seemed very productive, it did not catch on and mailboxes became stationary again. At the time of its appearance, the postcard had a slightly different purpose. If for those who still managed to survive the Soviet postal boom, when they were a real work of art, they were associated with a holiday and congratulations, then at first they rather served as a telegram. Moreover, it is open because no postal employee has seen the text of the appeal, and the very word postcard says that it is presented in an open form. At first, the postcards were just blank lines for text. Then they began to be used as a way of agitation and propaganda, often posting cartoons on them ridiculing the government. As a result, a special censorship was introduced, which forbade posting anything in such telegrams that contradicted the law, the norms of public order and morality. By the way, it was the Bolsheviks who used postcards as a place for their dogmas. At the end of the 19th century, postcards for the first time became beautifully illustrated. The first series was dedicated to the workers of Moscow streets. Among them were milkmen, janitors, tent sellers and others. In the 20s and 30s, the process of automation was actively going on in post offices. Various mechanisms have made it possible to speed up the work and make it easier. The active introduction of technology in this area was interrupted by the outbreak of World War E. The number of employees and their working hours were reduced, and some departments were evacuated. The load on the mail has increased for obvious reasons. At the same time, 50 million letters and parcels were sent to the front every month. Post offices, as strategically important objects, were subjected to regular intensified bombing. The duties of the employees now included ensuring their own safety. The attendants removed incendiary bombs from the roofs. Radio receivers were delivered to the post office, which were collected from the population at the beginning of the war, since the fascist side actively conducted propaganda on them. Moreover, they were taken for temporary storage, issued according to documents, and then issued back. After 1943, the closed branches resumed work and by the end of the war they were hit by a flurry of parcels from abroad. The Russian post has existed for more than a thousand years and is considered one of the oldest in Europe. Changing and adapting to the requirements of the time, it remains the main way of delivering goods and documentation, despite the global development of technology.